And welcome back to Hannity Now. President-elect Donald Trump again hosting high-profile meetings in New York, including a dinner tonight with former Governor Mitt Romney. And on Thursday night, the president-elect will kick off his, quote, USA Thank You Tour in Cincinnati, Ohio. Along with Vice President-elect Mike Pence, he joins us now in studio. First of all, congratulations. It's... Uh, Thank you, you, Sean. Has it hit you yet? Uh, no. no. Uh, <laughs> maybe yeah. January 20th, but we're so focused right now. The president elect is so focused on the work, on assembling um, a cabinet, assembling a government to move forward an agenda that we know is going to make America great again. We'll, we'll, lose, we'll leave the uh, when it hits us to later. Um, all right, so high profile meetings. You did have two announcements today. I've known Congressman Price for many yeah. years. He, yeah. He went into real depth and detail about replacing Obamacare, not an insignificant task, a big part of the Trump agenda. Well, it's, it'll, be, it'll be the first thing out of the gate. Um, uh, uh, we're going to be back on Capitol Hill tomorrow. Reince Priebus and I will be meeting with um, uh, the leaders of the House and the Senate. And the president-elect made it very clear. Uh, he wants the Congress, when they convene in early January, uh, to take up the task of repealing and replacing Obamacare first and the appointment of uh, Dr. Tom Price. Uh, as the head of Health and Human Services, someone who literally for the last half a dozen years has been in the forefront of efforts uh, not only to repeal Obamacare, but to put forward common sense free market solutions that will lower the cost of health insurance without growing the size of government is, is very exciting and, and should be a source of great encouragement to millions of Americans who know we've got to repeal Obamacare, uh, yeah. but we've, we've got to replace it uh, with, that's, that's a with, difficult with real solutions. Um, the average Americans pay in $4,100 more per family. So incredible. many lost their doctors, lost their, their plans, and projected increases this year. Do you have any idea on the time frame when that, might, that replacement might be able to happen? Well, I think, I think the first thing is to, is to repeal Obamacare lock, stock, and barrel and make sure that uh, we make it clear at the outset of this Congress uh, that, that we're starting over. Uh, on health care reform that, that respects the doctor-patient relationship and harnesses the power of the free market. You know, what, what President-elect uh, Trump has said over and over again is it's, it's time for us to allow Americans to purchase health insurance across state lines. It's, it's time to, uh, to give people more consumer choices, health savings accounts, something that he's championed since very early in the campaign. And, and Dr. Tom Price, soon to be Secretary Tom Price at HHS, is, is going to be able to help us take that agenda first to repeal and then to work with uh, leaders in Congress, in the House, and the Senate to craft solutions which, which will be implemented, you know, over a phased-in period of time. We don't, we don't want any American to be anxious about, uh, about a transition. It'll be an orderly transition, uh, as the president-elect said uh, in that famous speech in Philadelphia, but we'll be working toward uh, really a solution that's grounded in the American principles of free market economics and respecting the doctor-patient relationship. One position that seems to have gotten the most attention is Secretary of State. Right. Big meeting with, with Governor Romney tonight. I know that he was with General Petraeus yesterday. His name has been mentioned a lot. Rudy Giuliani's name, Senator Bob Corker's name. Uh, obviously, you, the decision hasn't been made. There are some good people here, but in the case of Governor Romney, who said some, called Donald Trump racist, misogynist, unqualified for the office, uh, apparently shared his donor list with, with uh, Evan, um, General uh, McMillan, in his run. Um, is that a game changer for you? Is that a difficulty overcoming that from your perspective? You know, it's, it's such a privilege for me to, it's almost hard for me to express that I'm the Vice President-elect of the United States, but to have been asked uh, uh, by the President-elect to chair the transition. My, my first obligation is to, is to bring together um, uh, you know, a broad range of men and women before the president-elect and his team so that he can sort out and create that lineup that's going to be able to move the Trump agenda forward in the Congress and all across the country. And I think, I think what you're witnessing here, and we met with uh, Senator Bob Corker today uh, at the Trump Tower with General Petraeus uh, yesterday. I met very often uh, with Rudy Giuliani uh, uh, and uh, uh, talked to John Bolton, communicated with him uh, today in the dinner that's happening tonight. I think what you're witnessing here uh, is, is a leader in President-elect uh, Donald Trump who, who wants to take in all the options. But I'm absolutely confident uh, that he's going to choose the right person in every single one of these cases that he believes is going to be best equipped 
uh, to move his agenda forward and more importantly move the country forward. Well, let me ask this. Uh, to me, the Trump agenda has been laid out and it's very simple. Originalist justices, right. vetting refugees, repatriation of trillions, 15% corporate tax rate, seven brackets to three, he's going to build the wall, eliminate Obamacare, energy independence, and education back to the states. If those six, seven, eight things get done, this will profoundly change America. Are you confident that all those agenda items will be accomplished? Well, I, I, I really am. I mean, we, uh, when the president-elect and I went to Capitol Hill just a couple short weeks ago, we met with uh, Leader McConnell, uh, with Speaker Ryan. Uh, as I said, I'll be back on Capitol Hill tomorrow as we're beginning to lay out the details of that. But I, I think... Uh, you know, my, my, my word when I went to Capitol Hill is I talked to members of Congress as I said, buckle up. Um, it'll be busy. <laughs> it'll be off, oh, it's, busy. Be, it's not just going to be a busy 100 days, Sean. It's going to be a busy 200 days. I mean, what, what, you, have, what you have in our president-elect, and you've known him for a long time, a lot longer than I have. Mm -hmm. This is a man of, of, of boundless energy and creativity, and, um, uh, and he, he is absolutely determined to move that agenda forward and move it forward quickly. We're going to start out of the gate by repealing and replacing Obamacare. We're, we're, going, to, we're going to take steps uh, to achieve real border security, build a wall, end illegal immigration. You're going to see an appointment at the Supreme Court uh, of a strict constructionist that's, that's uh, going to be in the tradition of the late and great Justice Antonin Scalia. And then before we get to the spring, uh, you're going to see uh, President Donald Trump make good on his uh, pledge to cut taxes across the board for working families, small businesses, family farms, and to, to, to roll back the kind of excessive regulations that are stifling American growth. And, and, and the other issues you mentioned as well. But Energy is, uh, I think, a big job uh, creating unleashing opportunity. Unleashing the power of, of yeah. the American energy economy, ending the war on coal. I mean, I mean it, it really is extraordinary. I think people have been watching this transition, and, and I think they're already getting a sense uh, of the boundless energy uh, that uh, President-elect Donald Trump is bringing well, into this effort, and I think it's only, you're only going to see that accelerate in the weeks and months ahead. So he, that, that's my word to them on Capitol Hill. I'll tell get them ready, tomorrow. Buckle up. Buckle up. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to go to work for the American people. We're going to make America great again. This is a great opportunity. Um, the only obstacle could be the Senate, the filibuster. And we know how Harry, Harry Reid dealt with that, especially when it relates to judicial appointments. Would you want Mitch McConnell to do the same thing? Well, I think, you know, they, they changed the rules there with regard to all the other court vacancies and, frankly, many of the confirmations. And, and uh, uh, you know, we're, we're very grateful to have a Republican majority in the Senate um, to have the necessary 51 votes to be able to move the president-elect's agenda forward. But I think w whether it's the Supreme Court, whether it's repealing and replacing Obamacare, whether it's fundamental tax relief or ending illegal immigration, I think the other thing you better get used to is, uh, it, and you're going to see it this week when uh, the president-elect and I hit the road, is um, um, a president, Donald Trump, is not just going to be talking to Congress. He's going to be talking to the American people. Uh, they, they he's going to be, he's gonna be taking his case consistently to the American people and encouraging them. As You remember that... That other president Ronald we like Reagan. a whole lot, Ronald Reagan, used mm -hmm. to do. It, go ask the American people to call your congressman and call your senator. And I think that's the reason why. I'm, I'm very confident uh, we're going to see we're going to see the Trump agenda move forward, and we're going to get this country we get this country working again and rebuild our military and do all the kind of things that will make America great again. What could we glean from what we have seen in terms of your role so far? Because you've been in most of these meetings. You've and they seem endless. They're <laughs> Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday. They don't seem to ever stop. Yeah. I, do, I have known him a long time. He doesn't really like vacations. He wants to roll up his sleeves and, and get to work. And let me ask you this. What have you learned through this process about Donald Trump that maybe the American people don't know that you'd want them to know? Well, I, you know, I, I've just gotten to know him over the last six months. And um, he's, he is, at his very core, he, is, he is, has an extraordinary intellect. He's extraordinarily creative. He's one of the most inherently curious people I've ever met in my life. To be in these meetings, and we've had this galaxy of, of extraordinary men and women uh, from a broad range of backgrounds, uh, you know, many Republicans, even some Democrats who have come in and sat down. And, and the questions that he asks, getting straight to the point, uh, it just continues to give me the confidence that I had when I said yes to this job last summer. That, 
Donald Trump's going to be a great president of the United States because he has the leadership qualities uh, to, to really to, to lead America forward and, and, and to inspire uh, our he nation seems, to greater heights. Look, there's been all sorts of definitions about the role of the vice president, but if we can glean anything from what we've seen in the last couple of weeks, you're going to have a very active role as vice president. Is that what you envision? Well, I, I, it, you've been the, in almost every meeting. Well, the role of the vice president will be exactly what the president defines it to be. And I believe in servant leadership. And I'm here to serve the president-elect in whatever capacity that he'd have me to serve. Um, and, and, but to be alongside him, I have to tell you, if you could be a fly on the wall I've in been these there meetings, a little uh, bit. Not, you know, not there in the meetings. You know, the, decision, the decision late today yeah. uh, to name Elaine Chow as the Secretary of Transportation. I mean, uh, someone who was the longest serving Secretary of Labor under the last administration since World War II. But before that, we, what, what President-elect Donald Trump was able to glean was actually the depth of her expertise comes in the area of transportation and infrastructure and his vision. Yeah. to rebuild the infrastructure of this country and, and ignite uh, a whole new era of American growth based on, on a, a renewal of our commitment to have the best, the best transportation on, you know, on, on land and water and, and air and, uh, in the world is, is going to be implemented by being able to identify someone like Elaine Chow and put her in the kind of position that can implement his agenda. Mr. Uh, Vice President-elect, it's an honor to have you in the studio. Thank you so much for your time. Good to we be appreciate with you, John. It. As the Trump transition team works into the night, the next Secretary of State, which is among the most powerful cabinet roles, has not yet been chosen. The top three contenders appear to be Mitt Romney, Rudy Giuliani, and former General David Petraeus. Tonight, as we've noted, President-elect Trump is dining with Romney. Kentucky Senator and former presidential candidate and Trump rival Rand Paul has been thinking a lot about who ought to get that job. And he joins us now. Senator, it's great to see you. Thanks for having me. So here are some of the names that have been floated. We just named them. Uh, in addition to uh, Romney, you had uh, former Mayor Giuliani. You also had John Bolton. Um, would you be happy with any of those three? You know, I think it's important that we or President Trump, President-elect Trump, nominate somebody who agrees with Donald Trump. Right. Donald Trump spent a lot of time traveling the country saying the Iraq war was a mistake, that nation building hasn't worked or made us safer, it's very expensive, and that regime change has led to unintended consequences. That's exactly where I am. That's why I like Donald Trump, right. is that I think he recognizes Iraq war was a mistake and some of the problems. So he should appoint somebody that recognizes that. I think both Giuliani and, and and Bolton, I would call them unrepentant advocates of the Iraq war. They haven't learned any of the lessons of the Middle East, so I don't think they would represent Donald Trump very well because they don't agree with Donald Trump's positions on the Middle East. What about Mitt Romney? I think it's, I don't know as much, but I know he's been fairly hardcore about supporting the Iraq war. And I haven't heard anything from Romney saying, well, he's skeptical or thinking that we should learn some lessons from that. But another reason why I think this position is very important is Donald Trump also says he wants to build our nation here at home, infrastructure. Right. You can't do nation building abroad and at home. We don't have enough money for that. So I think really you need a secretary of state who believes nation building is too expensive overseas. You know, we put a hundred billion dollars into infrastructure in Afghanistan. We don't have the money to do that and build our roads and bridges here at home. So your Secretary of State needs to agree with Donald Trump on nation building in order to have enough money left over for domestic policy Has as well. Has there ever been a Secretary of State in American history, though, who felt that way? I mean, is it one of those jobs where your views conform to the job and you find yourself identifying maybe a lot more with the concerns of other countries than you thought you would? Well, no, I think you want somebody who uh, one, does generally agree with with the world view of the president. So I think Donald Trump's world view has been Iraq war was a mistake, nation building doesn't work, regime change doesn't work. They may not agree completely, so you may not get a perfect clone of Donald Trump, but I think in order for Donald Trump's vision to be part of the State right. Department, he should appoint somebody who actually agrees with but Donald you, Trump. You keep saying he believed that Iraq war was a mistake, and yet we heard from the press for a year and a half that he was every bit <laughs> as implicated in the Iraq war as Hillary Clinton. Yeah, you know, sometimes the press completely gets it wrong. And this is the time where every night at home I'd be throwing things at my TV saying, why don't they get it? 
They kept going back to some interview you know, on, Howard Howard, Stern. on Howard yeah. Stern from 10, 15 years ago. And it's like, the point isn't exactly when he understood it, it's that he understands it now. Right. Hillary Clinton never understood it. Hillary Clinton continued to be for, she said she changed her mind on the war, but she continued to be for regime change in Libya. She continued to be for regime change in Syria. Hillary Clinton never learned the lesson of the Iraq war is that sometimes you change a regime. For example, when we got rid of Saddam Hussein, Iran became stronger. Iran is more of a menace now than they were when Saddam yes. Hussein was a counterbalance. So that was an example of regime change destabilizing a region and making us less safe. We got rid of Gaddafi, same thing in Libya. Hillary Clinton never understood that. Donald Trump did. That was a big difference, and yet the media quibbled about when he became opposed to the Iraq war, which wasn't so important as did he understand the lesson of the Iraq war. So you're saying that whoever takes this job needs to understand the lesson of the last 15 Absolutely. years of American foreign policy. But I wonder, does the Republican establishment in Washington understand it? So we're going to see who's chosen Secretary of State, but he'll have a massive staff beneath him, most of them Republicans from D.C., the foreign policy establishment. Right. Have they internalized the lessons? Well, the interesting thing is uh, his pick for National Security Advisor, uh, General Flynn, yes. has said that the historical lesson is that the Iraq War was a strategic failure. So there are people, even from the military, there were many people, you know, in Hillary Clinton's book, many of the generals, other than Petraeus, but many of the generals were saying, you know, regime change isn't going to work in Syria. We're taking our eye off of ISIS because we're getting too involved with trying right. to replace Assad. Petraeus sided with Clinton, of course, so I don't think he really gets the lesson either. Either. But if you look at Hillary Clinton's book about it, she was all for regime change. You know, we got to get rid of Assad. So was Petraeus. But many of the other generals in the region at the time were actually opposed to regime change. So if you were to boil down the purpose of America's foreign policy to a refrigerator magnet you would give to Donald Trump to look at every morning as he pulled his orange juice out of the fridge, what would it say? Defend America. Defend America. Yeah. And so the thing is, is there also is a difference between the Secretary of Defense and the Secretary of State. The Secretary of Defense has to have us prepared. We have to have the strongest, mightiest military that says, don't ever mess with us. But the Secretary of State needs to be a diplomat that tries to look for solutions other than war. Right. So, for example, if I were contrasting John Bolton with anybody else on the planet, I would say almost everybody else on the planet is more likely to advocate for war being the last resort, where I, was wor I would worry that John Bolton Bolton would advocate for war being the first resort. So it's John Bolton versus, as you put it, everyone else on the planet. Everyone that else does on the not planet sound like a ringing endorsement. Everyone else on the planet comes in ahead of John Bolton. Okay. Uh, Senator Rand Paul headed off to dinner with John Bolton. Great to see you. Thanks. Our next guest warns that a secretary, Romney, would leave Mr. Trump's supporters feeling betrayed, suggesting in a Fox op-ed today on foxnews.com, quote, President-elect Trump should get up every day and begin by looking at his own campaign promises. He owes his presidency to the people who believed in him, not to the courtiers and schmoozers who had contempt for him as a candidate, but adore him now that he's going to be president. Newt Gingrich is a former House Speaker and author of the book Treason. Mr. Speaker, good to see you tonight. So, you mm -hmm. called this potential appointment as uh, Mitt Romney as Secretary of State uh, a huge mistake and even outrageous. To those who say, all right, you know, Donald Trump knows what he's doing. This could be a counterbalance to some of the more, you know, hardliners in the administration he's creating. How do you justify those comments? Well, look, I mean, first of all, um, President-elect Trump can pick anyone he wants. He is going to be president. Uh, if he picks Romney, I'll support it because he has the right uh, to build a cabinet he wants to have. But as long as we're discussing the possibility, uh, I think it's a disaster. I think, first of all, uh, Romney's not like uh, the team of rivals around Abraham Lincoln. None of the team of rivals opposed Lincoln in the general election. Romney fought against Trump every single step of the way and fought against him with really vicious language. I mean, if you look at the things that Romney said about Trump, you'd have to say to yourself, uh, I don't care how good a schmoozer he is, uh, why would you believe him? I mean, if he comes in now and says, you know, all those mean, vicious things I said about you, I didn't really mean it, uh, give me a break. Uh, again, this is not well, the but, same but let me just, as somebody who's a competitor. Right let me challenge you on this. Sure. Even Kellyanne Conway said some very vicious things about Donald Trump. You know, maybe very <clears> vicious is too stretched, too much of a stretch, but she, she attacked him because she was, she was a Ted Cruz supporter. Of course. You know, that kind of thing tends to happen. And then they're both Republicans. They come together after the election. Mitt Romney and Donald Trump, reportedly, Donald Trump had a lot of respect for the way Mitt Romney ran Bain Capital. And, and Mitt Romney and, and Donald Trump have a mutual friend who tried to broker this alliance, according to a very interesting report today in, in the Washington Post. So can't that happen? Look, I, look, 
Sure, look, I, I have no doubt, for example, that Speaker Paul Ryan very much favors Mitt Romney. Romney picked him to be the vice presidential candidate. They are very close personally. Uh, Ryan Priebus, who is a great National Committee chairman, uh, is very, very close to Ryan and was National Committee chairman during a period when uh, Romney was the, the nominee. So uh, there are a lot of different uh, things going on here. I'm only suggesting that when you have potentially a Rudy Giuliani, uh, you have an Ambassador Bolton, you have a wide range of people you could reach out to, to decide that the person, and, and, and if you go back and you play the tone, the hostility, the contempt mm -hmm. uh, of the Romney speeches, and these were whole speeches. These no, you're weren't, right. You know, uh, it's pretty that hard to imagine. True. He went after <laughs> Trump harder than anybody. Well, you have to say yourself, why would Trump believe that Romney's going to be Trump's Secretary of State? I know he wants to be Secretary of State, but my hunch is he'll turn out to be Romney's Secretary of State. Mm. So we're going to see, because this is their second we meeting, and we're told that uh, <laughs> their wives also met tonight. I want to ask you, though, because you had some... You had a couple, first about this, this critique you had for the president-elect, and then I want to talk to you about the advice you had for him in his column. The first thing you said that was his biggest misstep in the three weeks since he won was that post on Twitter about widespread spread voter fraud in this election. Sure. Why was that so bad, where he asserted that he would have won the popular well, vote had it not been for allegedly a couple million illegal votes? Well, first of all, there's absolutely no proof that there were a couple million illegal votes. Second, there's a new standard now. He's about to be... President of the United States, really the leader in many ways of the entire planet, the most powerful country in the world, uh, and there's a standard of calm, accurate, clear. Now, I'm for him tweeting. I think, his, I think tweeting is very effective for him. I think it's a big part of who he is. But I really do think he needs an editor, and occasionally somebody needs to say to him, oh, maybe not this one. Uh, and I just thought that that was, it's not that one tweet, but it's what it signals about the lack of self-discipline uh, and the lack of focus uh, that I think as president he has got to acquire uh, because the world has to have a sense of reliability that when Donald Trump speaks that there's a certainty and an accuracy that they can count on every single day 365 days a year uh, and that's a big challenge right the gravity of that office uh, requires you know a, a Right. It's, it, it comes with a lot of responsibility. Let me ask you this. So you've been there. I mean, you, you know, you were part, you were the head of the contract with America uh, when, when the Republicans took over the House in 1994. And so you, you've seen a president come into office and, and govern and reach across the aisle and get things done. Uh, and you were part of that. You're ta you talk about in this Fox News piece that reasonableness will be the death of Trumpism. Reasonableness. Explain sure. what you mean by that. Look, Washington has a whole range of reasonable things. Uh, the culture of the Foreign Service is a disaster, but reasonable people know you can't really fix it. The Civil Service and the Veterans Administration is corrupt, is filled with people who don't do their jobs, is filled in some cases with people who, who literally have criminal records, but reasonable people know you can't really reform the Civil Service. You go down this list, you know, we know the Congressional Budget Office is a joke, its estimates are a total disaster, it was totally wrong about Obamacare, but reasonable people know you have to use it because it's the only thing we have, even if it's totally wrong. You just go down this list of reasonables, and every reasonable statement moves you to selling out and keeping the swamp full. It doesn't drain the swamp, it keeps it full. When I became speaker, I sort of shocked the city, because in my first speech at the Heritage Foundation on the Friday after the election, I said, you know, that, that I, I will cooperate, but I will not compromise. I had been elected to do the things in the contract with America. I had been elected to balance the budget. I had been elected to reform welfare. And I'd cooperate to get it done, and I think Bill Clinton and I did a pretty good job. But I wasn't going to compromise on our goals. Well, you know, Donald Trump has a contract with the American voter, which he outlined, I think, brilliantly at, at Gettysburg. He has the vision of a uh, new deal for African Americans, which he outlined in Charlotte. If he's going to get those things done, he's going to have to be unreasonable with a city which is a swamp because the swamp doesn't want to be drained. I mean, nobody in Washington is running around saying, oh, please come in here and change everything. They're saying, how do we slow him down? You know, in the Pentagon, the term for the political appointees is the summer help. Uh, how do we outlast them? Oh, the summer help wants to do something. Well, they'll be gone soon. And that's mm -hmm. kind of slow right. walking through across the whole city. Speaker Gingrich, great to see you. Thanks for being Good here. Good to be sir. with you. Thank you.